All right, well, hello and welcome. Multifunding is proud to partner with Cesar Castro of Strategic Storytelling to bring you this presentation of Strategic Storytelling for Business Brands. Cesar is a psychologist holding a dual master's degree, one in organizational psychology and the other in professional communications. He's an adjunct professor of communications and public speaking for some of the top universities in Latin America and the United States. He's a founder of three companies, two in Latin America and one in the United States, that focus on helping business leaders and entrepreneurs develop their influence and communicational impact by leveraging the power of stories. Caesar has worked with some of the top companies in the world, like PepsiCo, Walmart, MasterCard, MetLife, Kia, and many more. He's trained thousands of leaders and professionals in the art of strategic storytelling. He's also the creator and host of the Strategic Storytelling Podcast, which is one of the top Spanish-speaking podcasts in the world. He passionately believes that we can all become better communicators if we learn to become better storytellers. Again, thank you for joining us, and over to you, Caesar. Great. Thank you very much for that, that really nice introduction. I'm, I'm very excited to be here with you today. You can hopefully see it in my face because I love, I love teaching and specifically sharing with entrepreneurs, with others who are also building out businesses who maybe are either beginning or now they've already built something out and they want to know how to expand and how to grow their business. But I'm an entrepreneur myself. So anytime I get a chance to speak with entrepreneurs, it's it makes my day. And for all of you who are here today, who I know some of you might be in different stages in regards to your business, I do want to start out being very honest <laughs> and transparent and unfortunately sharing some bad news. And the bad news, there will be good news also, so don't just stay with the bad news, but the bad news is that we live in an era today where it's probably never been harder to stand out and to be able to grab our audience or our market's attention. Research shows that in any given day, we're bombarded by more than 5,000 different images, videos, uh, audio. So you can imagine, and if you have your own business, you probably live through this, how hard it is to really stand out. And, and to be able to have your audience's attention. And, and this is important for us to understand because if we don't have attention, it's really hard for us to have influence. Okay, I'm gonna repeat this because I want this to be a, a brain tattoo, something that we remember consistently as a principle. If we don't have attention, we won't have influence. And as a business brand, whether you are a company or you're a personal brand or you wanna build something out, it's really important for you to understand this principle because if you don't have influence, you won't be able to get or reach that audience that you're trying to reach and, and get things to happen. When we talk about influence and one of the best definitions of influence that I've actually heard, and I read it a while back, it was from Dwight Eisenhower, who was a, a famous general and president in, in the United States. He said that the art of influence is being able to get people or take people where you want them to go, but because they want to go with you. And that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to do as brands. We're trying to sell our product or get our product or our services out, trying to get people to obviously grab our product or buy our product, but we want to do it in a way that they also feel that it's something that's necessary. So this is the challenge. And this is actually one of the questions that I've asked myself for a very, very long time, which is how do we do that? How do we stand out when we are in a sea of, of brands and noise and, and, and technology? And probably as time moves on, it's going to get more and more difficult. How do we stand out? How do we become really, really memorable? And I actually, I had this challenge when I first started my business in 2014. And like many of you, when I first started my, my business, which is a consulting and training business, I, I dedicated time to crafting out my plan and my strategy to how I was, I was gonna reach the market. And once I had my plan and my strategy all figured out, I started sending emails, got on LinkedIn and started sending messages. 
hundreds of messages. And probably like some of you have, have, have lived the experience where you're sending out messages and when no one really knows who you are, you're not getting many replies. But I did start getting a few replies after a few months, after about six months of just sending messages out, trying to get meetings, trying to send out my beautiful brochure that I had created at that time. And I still remember I would go to meetings and I was actually having, I thought success because out of the hundreds of messages I was sending out, I was, I was usually getting, you know, five or six meetings uh, every week. But the interesting thing that started happening is that despite the fact that I was having meetings and I was going to these meetings with these big corporate clients, and when I'd get in the meeting, they would always ask me, you know, what do you do? What, what is your company about? I would always give them, I think, the typical answer. You know, as a consulting and training business, I would say, you know, I'm a consulting and training business where we focus on leadership development. And, and I would kind of give them a checklist of all the services and they would listen politely. And then they never call back. <laughs> I'd never have a second meeting. And I started getting very frustrated after, after a few weeks of this, having meetings, being able to give my presentation, which I thought was a good presentation at that time, and then never getting anyone to call back. And I remember during that time, I was reading books, you know, like we do as entrepreneurs, we read, we try to educate ourselves, we try to learn, which is what you're also doing in this webinar. And I was reading books about sales and, and influence and reading a book about marketing. And I remember I ran into a book of a marketing guru by the name of Seth Godin. Maybe some of you here have heard of Seth Godin before, and he's one of the the best known authorities in, in marketing and, 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 and how we can market differently. And I was, as I was reading one of his books, it caught my attention that he says, clients no longer buy because of the characteristics. So think about this. Clients, and especially now, and this was in 2014, but especially now where we're now inundated with more and more options and more and more information. He was saying back then, clients no longer buy just because of the characteristics of your product or your service. The clients buy because of the stories. Clients buy because of the stories. And as I thought about this and actually had a few sleepless nights thinking about this, what I realized is that I wasn't telling any stories. When I was going to my meetings, I was just showing my typical presentation where I was talking about the characteristics of my services and, and, and the benefits, but there were no stories. And I started asking myself, what is the story that I wanna communicate? What is the story that I think can connect and, and can generate something impactful in my audience. So hopefully I can be more persuasive and be more influential. And as I thought about this and kept reading different books, I, I came across a TED talk at that time, which was from Simon Sinek that talked about starting with why and being able to tell your why story or your origin story as a brand. And, and I clearly had an origin story. I was an entrepreneur that came from the corporate world, had started my own business. And I had a why story, but I had never shared that story before. So after thinking for it for a while and kind of organizing that story in my mind, I said, you know what, Next, the next client that I have a meeting with, I'm going to share that story. I'm going to share my why story. And the next client that actually accepted a, a meeting with me was one of the biggest banks in Latin America. So it wasn't any type of client. It was a client that could potentially mean huge, huge projects and a lot of income for my company. And I still remember that day when I was going to that meeting and I was convinced I'm going to tell my story. I'm, I'm going to go in there. And when they ask me, what do you do? What services do you offer? I'm going to tell them the story. Instead of just giving them the typical answers, I'm going to start with the why. And I walked into that meeting and it was with the team of human resources. And I remember that, you know, it was the first time I was meeting them. So the initial chit chatter, who are you, you know, wh where are you from, those type of things. And then, and then the question, well, tell us about your company. What do you do? <laughs> what are your services? And my heart was racing at that moment, because even though I was convinced that I had to share a story, I was scared. Is it going to work? What if I 
what if they don't like my story? But ultimately, I, I was, I try to be truthful to my conviction. And I got up and I said, you know, I don't just want to give you the typical answer that usually most of the other consulting and training companies probably give you when you ask them this question of what do you do? Because I will answer what I do, but before you, you really understand what I do, I want to explain to you why I do what I do. And something very interesting happened. At that moment, the four or five people that were in that meeting from human resources that were leaning back on their chair, kind of probably thinking in their, in their minds, oh, here's another you know, small consulting company that's going to try to sell us their service. They all leaned forward. And they were all with attention wanting to know what was this about. And this is what I said to them. And, and I'm actually going to tell you very briefly the why story because during this little webinar, I'm going to dissect it with you and, and I'm going to teach you how to do this yourself because you as an entrepreneur, you as a business person, you have stories as well. And you probably have a why story and you have a product story or a service story and you have client stories and you can build those all out. But this is what I said to them. I said, look, a few years ago, I was working in the corporate world, just like you. And in the corporate world, I, even though I had a good job, I had a very good position, I, I felt there was something missing. So I decided to start my own, my own company. And, and to be honest with you, when I first started, when I first became an entrepreneur, I didn't have a lot of clarity on what I wanted to do. I just knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to hopefully impact organizations or leaders in some way, but I didn't really know how. And my first few months as an entrepreneur, you know, I, was, I was trying to do different things to make sure a little bit of income would come in. And I still remember one Monday morning, one Monday morning, I got on the subway in Santiago de Chile, which is where I was living at that time in South America. And for those of you who maybe don't know much about Santiago de Chile, Mondays at 8.30 in the morning, <laughs> the train station or, or the metro, the subway is packed, jam-packed, literally like a sardine. And I remember I got on the subway on the station that I would usually go because I was going to, to my private practice. I, I'm also a psychologist by profession, so I had my private practice where I'd see patients Mondays in the mornings. And I got in, I got on the, on the subway, just like a sardine. I was really, you know, tight. And, and I felt good because at least, you know, I was going to my private practice. It was, it was my thing. It was a little bit of, of, of my uh, business that I was building at that time. And as I started to look at everyone's face, again, remember, Monday at 8.30 in the morning, everyone looked like they weren't very happy. Their face looking down. No one really smiling. No one excited <laughs> to go to work Monday at 8.30 in the morning. And right as I was looking and, 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 and kind of becoming aware of what's going on around me, there was a guy right next to me who picked up his cell phone and, and he started talking to someone. I think he might have been a friend, but I was so close to him that I could hear the conversation. And, and the first thing he says to his friend is, I'm going to work. And, and with that tone, I'm going to work. And then they kept talking and, and he started saying, oh, you know what? I hate my job. I, I don't like it. I don't like my boss. He doesn't respect me. I don't like the salary. And the whole time, it was just him talking about the negative things of his job. And what caught my attention the most and what actually impacted me the most was that towards the end of that conversation, he says to his friend, and as he's talking on the phone, he says, you know what? All I want, I just want it to be Friday. All I want is for it to be Friday. And I got off a few stations after it, and, and that voice resonated in me. All I want is for it to be Friday. And as I got off the, the subway station, I was thinking, wow, it's Monday morning. It's 8.30, just starting off the week. And this person who probably represents a lot of the people, they just want it to be Friday. They want it to be the weekend. And for the first time that I can remember, I started asking myself, have I ever felt this way? <laughs> have I ever felt on a Monday morning that I wanted it to be Friday? And I actually remembered 
that in two separate occasions, my back then professional corporate life, I had had experiences or moments where also Monday morning, I wanted it to be Friday. And the only thing that I found in common in both of these different moments of my professional life is that in both cases, I did not have good leaders. I did not have good bosses. <laughs> I didn't have bosses that inspired or that you felt connected or that you felt trusted you. And even though I liked my job and I was good at it, I didn't want to go to work. And I thought about that. And I said, that's it. That's the issue here. People don't just leave companies. We probably all heard this before. They leave their boss. People don't just leave their company. A lot of times people just want to leave their boss. And I said to myself, that is what I got to do. I got to help bosses become good leaders some way or another. And that's what I got to dedicate myself to. And that is why I'm here. Now, we go back to the meeting. <laughs> I just shared the same story that I shared with them. And they were all looking at me and paying attention. And when I finished that story, I said to the people in human resources that were in that meeting with me, I said, that is why I'm here. So I can obviously tell you what I do, but the real purpose of why I do what I do is because I want to help bosses become great leaders. Because when we have great leaders, we have better organizations and we have happier people. And one of the girls that was in the meeting said, that is what I believe as well. That is actually what I believe and feel as well. And that's why I'm in human resources because I believe the same thing as you. And this big client, this big bank actually became one of my best clients. After that meeting, we were able to sign a huge, huge contract that actually lasted two years where we did a, a really big consulting project where I actually had to incorporate more consultants onto my team. And it actually helped us survive for almost two to three years just with that project that I was working with that bank. All because of the power of stories. All because of the power of stories. And I wanted to share this with you because at the end, stories are the most powerful communication tool that we as human beings have. And one of the things that I've noticed as I've worked with many hundreds and thousands of leaders from different organizations all around the world is that despite the fact that a lot of us know intuitively that we should tell stories, that stories are, are good, they're fun, we like them, we don't use them enough. And let me tell you something. If you use stories and you know how to use them effectively in your presentations, in your communication, in your marketing for your brand, you're actually learning an important hack, an important hack that's based on neurology. Because we as human beings, we've been telling stories for over 100,000 years before we could even speak formally, before we had language and we had alphabet and we could read, we, we, tell, we told stories. And, and, and we find that when, when we actually find, you know, anthropologists finding caves, drawings that are thousands and thousands of years old of, of people that were hunting and people that were traveling, those were our first attempts of telling stories. So because we've been telling stories for such a long time, our brains, and this is an important secret for you, our brains are hardwired to pay attention. Attention, which I told you at the beginning is crucial to be able to have influence. Our brains are hardwired to pay attention whenever we perceive or we think that someone is going to start telling us a story. And it's because stories are more than just information. Now, we're constantly communicating information with our brand, with our services, with our products. The great thing about stories and why they are so powerful is that stories are actually information with emotion. And it's that perfect balance or mix of information with emotion that actually gives us more influence in people's decisions and people's actions. And that is why stories are up to 20 times more memorable. 
And this is research that has been done over and over again. And that show the same thing. Anytime we hear a story, whatever information is conveyed or communicated within that story, we tend to remember it up to 20 times more. Stories are 20 times more memorable than just communicating facts. Stories are 20 times more memorable than just communicating data. Stories are 20 times more memorable than just, just giving numbers. And that's why probably if you think about a meeting that you've been to lately, if you think about a presentation where they maybe showed you a bunch of data or they showed you a bunch of information or graphs, and I were to ask you, hey, do you remember graph number three? Or do you remember slide number 10? Oh, I don't know. I probably wouldn't remember it that much. But if someone told you a story, you're pretty sure to remember it for a very, very long time, especially if the story connected with you. So this webinar and everything that I've shared with you up to now is kind of just setting up the context because in this webinar, the good news <laughs> is that I'm going to teach you how to do that. Because the good news is that we are all, in a way, we are all storytellers. We've been doing this for a while. We as human beings have been telling stories for a very, very long time. And you who are listening to this, you probably tell stories as well. Well, I know you tell stories as well. When you get home and, and you sit down with your kids or with your loved one or with, with your wife or your husband and, and you, you, they ask you, hey, how did your day go? You don't pull out a PowerPoint presentation with you know a bunch of data. <laughs> we don't do that. That's not natural in our communication. What we do is we tell stories. We say, "Hey, oh, you don't, you, you won't know what you know. You can't imagine what happened to me today in this meeting, or I was driving and I I saw this." And we try to tell and communicate stories because the way that we organize information in our minds and the way that we communicate it to the external world is through stories. So the good news for you is that you are already a storyteller in some way. Now, the challenge, and this is why I'm here today, is that despite the fact that we know how to tell stories, a lot of us don't know how to use those stories strategically. We don't know what's called strategic storytelling, which is a little bit different than just storytelling. Storytelling is the art of communicating by using stories, which is something we all do. Strategic storytelling is the art of influence, the art of, of being able to generate change by using stories. So it's learning how to use stories as a vehicle so we can communicate our message, so we can get our brand or our products across, and we can stand out in people's minds and their hearts, even though they're being bombarded by a bunch of other information. So to be able to help you do this, to be able to learn how to do this in a very, very simple, practical way, I'm actually going to teach you what I call cosa. And, and, and just so you know, you're also here and you're going to have a little Spanish lesson because the word cosa in Spanish means thing. So when I teach this in Spanish, I always tell my, my clients, I'm about to teach you la cosa más importante or the most important thing so you can create or craft a powerful brand strategic story. And the great thing is that as you remember this word, cosa, which has these four letters, you're also going to remember the four steps because this process to be able to craft a strategic storytelling, a strategic story only has four steps. And I want you to remember this word as a way to remember the four steps. So, so when, when they ask you, hey, what did you learn today in the webinar? You're going to say, I learned cosa, <laughs> or I learned the most important cosa, which means thing to be able to create a strategic story. So I want you to take notes. I see that someone has their hand raised. What we're gonna do, just so you know, at the end of this presentation, we're gonna take about 10 to 15 minutes to answer the questions, okay? So, so please, if you do have a question, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy that you have a question. Just write it down. You can either write it down in the, in the Q&A or the chat, and Ali is gonna, is gonna write those down. So that way after, when we have 10, 15 minutes at the end, I'll be able to answer some of those questions and, and hopefully give you, you know, be able to give you something directly since you're here in this, in this uh, webinar. So get your pencil, paper, or however you're taking notes out, because this part, learning these four steps is going to be a before and after for you in how you create and craft a strategic story that, again, you can use it for your brand, 
You can use it for your marketing. You can use it for your communication in general. So the first step to be able to craft a strategic story, every strategic story will start with what's called a context, a context. And even though the word context is kind of hard to, to get a grasp on, what really is context is the beginning of a story. That's it. Every story has a beginning. So where does your story begin? And in order to create a, a very quick and simple context, because I'm trying to give you here kind of the recipe so you can go through these steps in a very practical and simple manner. The way that you can create a very fast and powerful context in whatever story you're telling is by just answering three questions. Okay, just three questions. Question number one, when? I don't know why it's it came out white like this. It shouldn't it shouldn't be shouldn't be white, but the the image in the back for some reason is not popping up. But the the first question is when, okay? When and when refers to when refers to the the time. When did this happen? This happened a week ago. This happened a month ago. This happened last week. In the story that I told you, this happened in 2014 when I was starting my business and having my first few meetings. So the first question you always have to answer in any story that you're telling is when? And it doesn't require a lot of details or sophistication. Just say two weeks ago or a month ago or in 1990 or in 2002, and you've answered the first question. The second question is where? Where? Referring to place. Where did the story happen? Did it happen in your office? Did it happen while you were on vacation? Did it happen while you were walking down the street? In my case, it happened while I was in a meeting with a really important client. And the third question is who? And who refers to person. Who are the characters? And specifically, who is the main character of your story? Because this is an important principle for you to remember. Every story will always have a main character. Every story will always have a main character. There can be other characters in the story. In my story that I just told you, you know, there were the people from Human Resources. Seth Godin was in my story as I shared with you what I learned from him. But it's my personal story that I'm telling you because it's, it's my why story. So I'm the main character of my story. But the important thing here for you to remember is when you talk about the characters, when you introduce the characters or your story, the goal will always be to generate connection with your audience. And by connection, I mean, get the audience to hopefully, as they're listening to your story, resonate really quickly or feel like even though you're telling your story, they're listening to their own story. So when I started my story, and I know that most of you who are here are business people, are entrepreneurs, but you can have a small business, you can have a larger business, but you're trying to have success as a business and entrepreneur. So because I know that, when I start my story as, you know, I was an entrepreneur just like you, and, and I actually, when I started my business in 2014, at, at the beginning, when I created my plan and created my presentation, I started sending a bunch of emails and trying to contact, and, and I would get some replies, but I wouldn't have success in the meetings. When I do that, I know I'm connecting with with a big part of the audience. Because if you're an entrepreneur, if you started your own business, I know for a fact that you've probably faced something very similar. I mean, who, when they start their business, just touches things and it turns into gold? I don't know one yet. I don't know an entrepreneur who, who, who that happens to. Most entrepreneurs at the beginning struggle. They have their ups and downs. Sometimes they might have something good that happens in the next month. They don't have something that's that good. Or when we're trying to build out our brand initially, we're contacting people and they're probably not replying. They're not answering our emails. We've all had that happen. So because we've had that happen, you connect with the character. And now you're also connecting with the story. And this is an important principle because this is the goal of the context. When you're telling a story, the goal of the context is to get people to connect with the main character of the story. Because if you're able to connect and you're able to, in a way, resonate and feel like, oh, what Cesar is saying also happened to me. You know, him, him and I are, 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 are not that different. We're actually alike. He's kind of even telling my story. If, if that starts happening as you're telling your story, and this is important because when you're telling your brand story, you want to do the same thing with your audience. 
You want to do the same thing with whoever you're trying to influence. You want them to hear their own story as they're listening to your story. And if you're able to do that, you've accomplished the goal for the first part of a story. So I want you to know that each one of these steps has a, has a goal, okay? Each one of these, these steps that I'm gonna be teaching you has a goal. The goal in the context is just to create connection. And we do that very simply by answering these three questions. When did it happen? Where did it happen? And who did it happen to? Once you're able to create that connection, that emotional bond, now we have the second, the second step, second phase of a strategic story, which is the obstacle. And, and the obstacle is important because what the obstacle teaches, I don't know why the, I'm sorry about the, the image thing in the back. I don't know why they didn't show up. But when we talk about an obstacle, we talk about a challenge. Like there's, your story's got to have some kind of a challenge. It's got to have some difficulty to it, or, or it's got to present failure. There's got to be something that's going on in your story. It can't be all just roses and everything's great. If you think about it, when you, when you listen to a story or when you watch a movie or you read a book, we don't want everything to just be rosy. We don't want everything to be great. We want the struggle. We want there to be a challenge. We want the main character to go through something to be able to accomplish what they want to accomplish. It's hardwired, again, in our brain that when we're listening to a story, we're expecting there to be some kind of a challenge, some kind of difficulty. And this is really important, but at the same time, when I've worked with leaders, especially in the business world, and they're trying to tell their stories, I realize that a lot of times we, we try to avoid this part of the story, right? We don't want to talk about the difficulty. If I'm talking about my brand or if I'm talking about my product or my service, we, we never want to talk about failure. We never want to talk about what the challenge, what challenge we've had. We, we always want to talk about just the great things and all the, the awesome things that we can do. But the thing is that that part of talking about the solution, talking about all the great things that your story or that your brand or that your product or your service has to offer, it makes no sense and it has no value, no relevancy, unless there is a challenge. So the key in this part of your story is to be able to show vulnerability, to be able to show vulnerability. And vulnerability, I want you to please understand it not as the typical kind of the media communication of vulnerability, which is you know, weakness, poverty. No, no, vulnerability understood from its original definition, which comes from psychology. Vulnerability is just the act and the ability of being able to express genuinely your emotions. I'm gonna repeat this. Vulnerability is the act and the ability to be able to express and show genuinely or honestly your emotions. That is vulnerability. And, and that's why in psychology, vulnerability is actually a strength. It's one of the characteristics of emotionally smart people or emotionally intelligent people is that they can be vulnerable in the right setting, in the right context, obviously. When we're telling a story, if there's a conflict, if there's, a, if there's some kind of a, 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 a challenge, that is the best moment to be able to show vulnerability. If you're the main character of the story, you have to show some level of vulnerability. If you remember the story that I told you before, I told you that when I was first starting out my business, I, I failed. I, I, I sent out emails and, and people wouldn't answer. And then when they did start answering, I'd go to meetings and no one would call me back for a second. Now I could tell you that from when I started my business, I was able to close big projects and everything went well and 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 that's the end of the story. And you would have been like, oh, okay, that's interesting, that's great, but that's not my story. But the the honest and the the vulnerable part of what I'm telling you is that it didn't happen like that. I struggled. And even when I was going to go to that first meeting after I knew that I had to tell a story, I didn't want to do it. I was scared to do it. I doubted myself. And that is showing vulnerability. And the interesting thing about being vulnerable in certain parts of your story is that it actually helps you to generate emotions in your audience. And, and that, is, that is what you want to do in this stage of your story. That is the goal. You want to be able to create strong emotions in your audience. Because the more they feel, the more they'll remember your story. The more they feel, the more emotionally invested they'll be in your story. And, and this is key because 
the one part of our story where we can really get people to feel emotions, where we can get them to feel anxiousness or nervousness or happiness or sadness is in the obstacle of the story, is in the conflict. When you do that, when you're able to accomplish that stage of the story where you're able to get people to feel something, now you go to the solution. Now you go to the solution or the typical happy ending, <laughs> which we all know when we watch a movie or when we read a book or we're watching a series on Netflix, we know that there's got to be a, a happy ending. Right? There's, there's something in us that says, okay, if I'm watching this story or if I'm listening to the story, at the end, there's got to be something good that comes from it. Can't just be that he's telling me that he struggled as an entrepreneur and, and that he they never called him back for second meetings. And then if I were to finish the story right there and say, and well, and they never called me back. And uh, I was, I had to close down my first business and I, and I haven't had success ever since. If I did that, in your mind, you'd be thinking, okay, <laughs> why are you telling us this? What's the point? The point is that there's a solution. And you know, intuitively, that there's gotta be something good that comes from this challenge that he's going through. So when we're talking about a solution in a story, we're actually talking about being able to answer a few questions, okay? Question number one is how did he or she, referring to the main character of the story, how did he or she solve the problem? That's that's the first question that we can answer when we're when we're in the solution of a story. How did he or she solve the problem? Or if the story you're telling doesn't have the typical solution because maybe they didn't solve the problem, maybe you're telling a story and you're sharing a story of when you failed, the next question would be, what did he or she learn from that experience? Because we, we have stories also that don't have the typical happy ending where we maybe, because we didn't communicate well with our team or because we weren't able to market our products effectively, we lost in the market or we weren't able to accomplish our goals. And, 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 and if you ask me, that's the end of the story. I, I don't know what else like we lost. We didn't achieve our goals. That's it, Cesar. There's nothing that comes from that. And if I ask you, okay, all right. But what did you learn from that experience? Now looking at it in retrospective, what did you learn from not reaching your goal? Why didn't you reach your goal? And most of the time when we even have those situations where we failed and we start thinking about what did I learn from the experience, you start finding a solution. Oh, you know what? I learned that I have to communicate better with my team. Or you know what? I learned that that it's never a mistake to over communicate in your marketing. It's it's good to communicate and communicate. I I was, you know, I we we didn't market our product well enough because we we didn't want to saturate people so we didn't communicate enough. And now I learned that you have to communicate enough if you really are convinced about your product or your service, you got to communicate it constantly, consistently. I learned that there's the solution. Because the objective in this phase or part of your, of, your, of your story, the goal is to just be able to show the change or the transformation that the main character of the story has had. What is the change that the main character of the story has had because of what they've gone through? And what I'm about to tell you, I know that this will burst the bubble of what stories are all about, but I'm, I'm opening the curtain so you can really understand what's What's in the DNA of a story? So all the stories that you've ever heard, all the stories that you've ever listened to, that you've ever watched when you were watching a movie or that you read when you were reading a book, every story, what they're really trying to show or, or in a way uh, explain is the transformation or change of a character. That's what all stories are about. They're always about the transformation or change of a character. So when you're talking about Cesar, and what about my brand? What is the change or transformation that I'm trying? What is the character? Who is the character if I'm talking about my brand? A lot of times the main character can even be your client or your potential client. And in the solution, what you're showing is how the product or the service that you give can generate that change or transformation in that client or that customer or whoever you're trying to reach. But that is, that is the, the ultimate 
sign of any good story is that they will show the change or transformation of a character. Now, with these three steps that I've shown you just now, you, you, you will have a good story. And just know that. If you, if you have a context to be able to create connection, that, that's good. That's a good initial phase. If you have some kind of an obstacle to, to be able to generate emotion, to show conflict or show challenge, now you'll, be, you'll have people emotionally invested. And third, if, if you show a solution, now you'll be able to also show what's the change or transformation that the main characters had. And, and those three steps, even though there's four, I told you that there's four, those three steps at least will make a good story. But there's a fourth step that will make all the difference. There's a fourth step that will actually transform this whole process into a strategic story, okay? That fourth step is called the application, the application. And the application, it, it, this part has to do with the audience. So when you're telling a story, even if it's a personal story, even if it's a story about someone else, you always have to remember that as the audience is listening to your story, they're, they're asking themselves a few questions. For example, okay, what does this have to do with me? So he's telling me a story about when he started his business, which is great. He told it in a way that was in engaging, entertaining, but what does it have to do with me? So your, your audience will be asking themselves that question, number one. Or two, why should I care? What does it have to do with me or why should I care? So in the application, now you're telling the audience why they should care or what does this story that I just told you, what does it have to do with you? So the story I told you before about my why story, I could have just told you that story and just said, that's my why story. And some of you would have said, okay, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> and it was, it was great, but I don't know why he told me that story yet. But if you remember, once I finished telling you the why story, I said, stories are powerful and you should also be telling stories. And you know why you should be telling stories? And then I went and explained the neurological effect and how stories are just, they're not just information, but they're also emotion and how they're 20 times more memorable. And hopefully by then I have you in a, in a stage where you're thinking, I, I want to learn how to do this. Okay, I believe you. I've lived it now through your story. I want to learn how to do this. And now I'm showing you the step-by-step -step process of how to be able to craft or create a great story. Because what you want to accomplish here, the goal in this stage of, of your story, which is the application, now you want to be able to influence the audience to take action. So in this stage of your story is where you're inviting your audience to take action. Whether that action be to buy your product or buy your service, or whether that action be if you're teaching something or a principle, apply this principle or tell more stories. In the application is where you're in a way connecting the big idea that you wanna to communicate to the story that you just told. Because as people remember the story, they will also remember the message that you're trying to get across. And that is la cosa más importante, or that is the most important thing. And when you remember this word, cosa, you're gonna remember these four steps. Because remember, every great strategic story has context, has a context so you can create connection, has an obstacle so you can generate emotion, has a solution so you can show the change of the main character or one of the characters of the story, and has an application. So you can, in this part, connect with the audience, the idea, the product, or the service that you're trying to get across. That is la cosa más importante, or the most important thing to be able to craft a powerful strategic story that you can use with your brand stories, that you can use with your personal stories that you want to communicate to your, to your audience, or that you simply just want to be able to communicate messages that you know will resonate and will connect people with the values and the principles that your brand, in a way, stands for. That is la cosa más importante. And that's what you have now in your hands. So I want to invite you 
because I know that most of you already have stories. Most of you already have a story that, that you used for your brand, or you have a personal story that you use in meetings with clients when you're trying to you know, initially connect with them or create credibility. What I challenge you to do is to grab that story that you're already using and to make it go through this COSA method. Okay, make it go through these four steps. Ask yourself, does it have a context? And in that context, am I able to create connection by answering these three questions? When, where, who? Then ask yourself, is there an obstacle in my story? I, I can guarantee most of you in the stories that you have, there's no obstacle. There's no challenge. There's no difficulty. And those stories are not even worth sharing. We, we don't even like those type of stories, yet we, we, we use them in our presentations. So ask yourself, does my story have an obstacle so I can generate emotion and, and, and connection, emotional connection with my audience. Third, does it have a solution? Does it, does it show the transformation or change that the main characters had, whether it be because he solved the problem or, or because he learned something from having gone through the challenge that he or she went through? And fourth, does it have an application? What is the message, the idea that I'm trying to get across and connect to the story so every time my audience remembers the story, they'll also remember that message or that idea. Because ultimately, strategic storytelling is all about using your stories as a vehicle. So the story is not the end. It's a means to an end. The end is the idea. Your product, your service is an idea. If you think about it, it's just an idea that we've tangibilized, but it's an idea. So that idea that we want to get across, that is the end. That is, that is what will generate the impact or the change if our audience buys our idea, or uses our product or uses our service, the vehicle to be able to make sure that that idea hits home and not only rationally, but also emotionally is the story. And that is la cosa más importante or the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Ali, how are we doing on time? We are good on time. Um, uh, I just sent the link to the post webinar form in the chat through this form. Attendees, you can request uh, the recording of today's session and the slides, the Q&A yeah, so, box. So the slides, you guys will get them afterwards. I, I don't know why, Ali. I had tried them before. They came out white, but the slides had images and stuff behind them. So when you do get the slides, you'll at least be able to connect it with <laughs> the things that I was saying. Yes. Um, great presentation. The Q&A box is open. We don't have any questions yet, but if you do have questions, we can hang on for a couple minutes. I know sometimes it takes a second to type in your question. Leave those in the Q&A box and we can get those answered for you. Yeah. yeah. Happy happy to be able to you know use these next 10 minutes to answer questions, applications for you. Maybe you, as you were listening to this, you thought about something in particular about the story that you use, or maybe you have questions about how to find stories, how to, how to tell them better. Because today we just talked mainly about how to, how to structure and craft those stories. But usually in the storytelling method that I teach, there's three big pillars, which is how to find stories, which is an art form in itself, how to find them. Then second, how to craft them. And that's where we can use the COSA method. And then third, how do we tell our stories? If we're going to tell them orally, we're going to tell them in a presentation. How do we tell them in a way that, that creates that impact? All right, we don't have a question, but we do have some feedback. One of our attendees saying, no questions, but I want to say that the presentation really resonated. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I, I, I love that feedback. <laughs> I love that feedback. So this these next minutes are for you. So you go ahead and 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 put on the chat whatever question you have. I'm happy to, to help answer any of those questions. Either everything was very clear, Ali, or we have a, a shy group today. <laughs> um, if anybody also, if you'd wanna ask your question verbally, you can raise your hand and we can grant you access to talk. Yeah. But Caesar, thank you so much. This was an amazing presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing this to fill out the form. Oh, we do have a hand raised. Awesome. All right, Justin, you're able to talk. 
Hello, Caesar. Can you hear me? Yeah, Justin. Awesome. I really appreciate the presentation. Um, that was uh, very reassuring um, okay. as we are creating our story. Um, one thing that I wanted to tap on was as a sales representative and when you're selling your brand, a lot of the times the clientele get very personal. And I know they say that you sell yourself in a way. So sometimes creating those relationships really rely on telling my own story. Um, what is your take on your own story, selling yourself versus selling the brand? Great, great uh, question, Justin. I, I there, There's a principle that, that is based on communication and, and influence, which says that the, the audience, right? When we talk about audience, your client, whoever that audience is, the audience, they first want to connect with the messenger before they connect with the message. <laughs> that's that's an important influence principle. And because we're social beings, so we want to connect with who is it that's communicating the information. Now, depending on the sales process, because I know there are certain products or services that can take a little bit longer. For example, in my case, consulting or, or training, which is what I was doing at the beginning of my business, sometimes was a process that took a few a few meetings to be able to right. finally lock something down. So if you know that your sales process is a little bit longer, I, I would structure it out in a way where maybe that first meeting is just going to be a, a get to know you and create connection and, and hopefully generate some credibility. You know, that first meeting, I'll just go and and we'll ask questions so the client can tell their story. And I'll see if, if there's a chance where I can tell my story as well. Then in the second meeting, after I've kind of lifted up all those needs and the doubts that the client might have, now I'll go in with more of a solution. So a lot of it is based also on what is it that we're selling. But mm -hmm. I do firmly believe that even if we try to sell in that first meeting because our product is just something that's a quicker sale, we should always remember that we are social beings and we make decisions based on how we feel. And, and it's there's actually a, studies that show that people make decisions in the first seven seconds once they, they right. see you. So a lot of times if you're thinking about that. We haven't even in seven seconds, what have I communicated in seven seconds? Maybe I've just said, hi, how are you doing? But people are already making decisions about you in those first seven seconds based on your tonality, based on, in, in, in your case, if you're doing a, a physical meeting, how you look physically, mm -hmm. um, based on your smile. You know, if you look like you're a friendly person or if you look like you're an ornery person, all those things, People are making decisions in those first few seconds of whether I trust you and whether you're a friend or, or you're an enemy. Right. And if, if in those first seconds, because you weren't aware of this, you went into that meeting and it was kind of uncomfortable and, and, and maybe you didn't know how to smile right or your tonality came out wrong. If that person in those first few seconds says, you know what, I'm not, you know, Justin makes me feel weird. He's right mm -hmm. away. That person, no matter what you say afterwards, even if you show very logical and rational information, that person already made an emotional decision that they're not going to buy from you. So right. the whole time you're showing them information, they're already trying to justify in their minds the reason why they're not going to buy from you. So they'll find something. You know, people will find something. They'll find anything. They'll find a little a little glitch. They'll 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 be like, oh, he had a misspelled word. They'll find something to try to justify the decision that they made emotionally, which is eh, just, I didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. So we have to be aware that those first few seconds before we even tell a story, people are already making decisions. So if we can come off right, and then plus we have a good story that can help people connect or that can help people know that we're credible or that we are we know what they're going through, now now the, the, the road will be probably much easier. Exactly, I love that, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. That was a good question. Who else has a question? If if, if there is no 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 question alley that comes up soon, I, I, I do I can expound a little on this because this topic of how do you create that that impactful first impression is crucial, especially if you're in sales. Well, if you're in any kind of, because you're we're all in sales, right? Even if if I'm like, oh, I give presentations and I give keynotes, but I'm also in sales because when people meet me for the first time, in a way, you're trying to sell your idea, you're trying to sell yourself. So in those first few seconds, there's actually three things that you should be really aware of. 
Okay, three things that you should be really aware of. And, and some of these are very obvious, but they're so obvious that sometimes we don't, <laughs> we don't even think about them. Okay, the first thing that you should be aware of is your eyes, where you look. So you've all been probably in a meeting or you've met someone that when you meet them the first time, if, if they don't look at you in their eyes or they look on to the floor, or they look somewhere else, right away it creates an emotional reaction which is, oh, this person is either like weird socially or they're trying to hide something. So the first thing we got to remember is look at people in their eyes, okay? You don't have to be psychopathic about this. You don't have to be like this, but you know, a good stare in their eyes creates connection. And what it does in our brain, it lets them know that we are trustworthy just because we're looking at their eyes. So that's the first thing we always have to be aware of is that we're looking at people's eyes. When we're doing a presentation like this one, Look at the camera because <laughs> the camera are the eyes of the people. So I've been in meetings before where someone is presenting and they'll have like their screen with their presentation here. So the whole time they're looking away from the audience. And when that happens, you lose connection with the audience. So I know it's uncomfortable, especially if we're doing Zoom meetings to be looking at the camera because our tendency is to want to look at people's eyes. But if people are, for example, in the Zoom, they're down here and you're looking down the whole time you're gonna lose that connection with people. So look at the camera or look at the eyes, number one. Second is smile. It's so simple. And this, this side of the world, smiling is a good thing. I say this side of the world because in the other side of the world, I, I was actually doing a, a workshop once for a company in Germany. <laughs> and they told me that, that culturally, culturally, especially in the business world, smiling is not looked upon as a good thing. It's actually look like you're childish or, you know, you're not a serious person. So culturally, there are things that we should be aware of sometimes. But in this side of the world, smiling is a good thing. Smiling means I'm friendly. And we want to do business with people who we like or who at least seem friendly. So that's the second thing. And the third one, and this one I hope will catch your attention, is our hands. Our hands. And a lot of times we think, oh yeah, the hands, because you know we, we grab people's attention if we move our hands. Yes, it's true. When you move your hands or when you're moving a little bit more or you're changing your speed and tonality, you're grabbing people's attention. But our hands, we are genetically hardwired to look at people's hands to see if they have anything that could harm us. So think about you know a long, long time ago when we lived in caves and we were traveling through the savanna from one place to another. If we came across another tribe, the first thing we would do is look to see if they have any weapons. Because if they have a weapon, that means they're, they're dangerous. They could harm us. So our hands are a sign of, I'm not here to harm you. I'm friendly and I'm trustworthy. And if you think about it, in most cultures, we greet people by showing our hands. So we can go like this, or we shake hands. In Latin America, you literally hug people. In other countries, you, you bow, but you're showing your hands. Why? Because hands are a way to show people, and this is something that happens, again, in their, in their subconscious mind, that we're not a threat. So if you're able to look at their eyes, if you're able to smile, and you're able to look at, show your hands, in those first few seconds, at least you're telling the other person, I'm not a threat, I'm friendly, and that will automatically activate in their brain at least the desire to want to listen a little bit more. Then if you have valuable information, if you have good stories, if you have a good product or service, now you're, you're, you're taking them for a ride. But those first few seconds are crucial so people will want to listen to the rest of what you have to say. So eyes, smile, and your hands. And looks like we do not have any other questions, but thank you so much for extending on that topic. That was a very... It's very simple things, right? Very practical. Yes. A lot of times when, when I teach these things to my clients, they say, oh, it's so obvious. Yeah, it makes sense. But then it's so obvious that we don't do it. That's, that's, the, that's the issue with obvious things or common sense. It's, that this, it's the sense that we least use, right? Because we think it's so common sense, but a lot of us are not even aware of those things. So when we do go to meetings or when we do meet people for the first time, Whatever happens to my hand, my face, my eyes, it'll be kind of luck. And sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. But if you're aware of it and you can train those things, now you have much more probability and influence that that first interaction will be positive. And if it's positive, it opens up the doors to a lot more things.
All right. Well, looks like we're ending right on time. Thank you so much. This was a great session. I hope that everyone learned a lot from this session. I sure know I did. Caesar again. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like that is all. Awesome. Take care. Take care. Have a good one.